Thank you. Gosh. Um, excuse me, just one sec. No, 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 I'm good. I'm good. Just getting rid of some stuff. So, as we get older in life, we sort of accumulate stuff. And unfortunately, some of it, it's our gut, is it's something that we can't always just put aside. Um, so picture this. And, you know, I was three. No, it's 1979, and I was 18. Um, and I was, it was a hot day. It was a hot day like today. And I'd just arrived at New College, Oxford. I'd driven up there. It was the beginning of my first semester up at Oxford. I'd never actually formally applied. I was a little nervous. I'd never put pen to paper. I'd never signed an application form. And here I was, starting college. I drove in, and they had this habit of putting your name to the bottom of the staircase. I saw my name. I go, OK. I actually did get in. And I was like, you know, it's this hot day. Everyone was chatting around. And somehow, I had got into a decent university um, without actually applying, unlike everybody else who was around me. It's kind of like, how did that happen? So roll the clock back about three months. Now, in England, we had these things called A-levels, a bit like your SATs. And I was never academic. I was, you know, if there were 15 people in the class, I usually got to like the 16th grade. And I got my A-level results, and they were really good. And I was angry. And to this day, I don't really know why I was angry. But I think part of it was this was disturbing the plan that I was on. And you know, I had decided I wanted to go and study at university mathematics and philosophy for two simple reasons. I could play with numbers. I was good with math, didn't enjoy it. And I didn't know how to write. And so I thought there was a, you know, kind of hedged within there. And now I had these results. I was like, damn, I got to like see if I can go to Oxford or Cambridge or whatever. Oxford was the best place in the UK for mathematics and philosophy. So I go, and there weren't websites, but I looked it up. And there was someone who had the title. And this is a fantastic, if you ever have a job title, this is a great title. He was the matriculator for the joint on the subject of mathematics and philosophy at Oxford. I have no idea what the guy did, but I called him up. And I said, hey, is there any way I can get in this term? I know the application process was like, you know, a while back. He goes, I don't know, but come on up and see me. So I got in my car and I drove up and I went to talk to him. And it's the middle of the summer. And I'm like, I'm telling him how I don't want to take a year off and travel the world. I'm in a hurry. And he goes, well, you know, we have admission tutors at each college. So let me call the admissions tutors. So he started calling and long vacation, no one's around. He's on his eighth call. He's about to hang up the phone. And this squeaky voice says, Wilson Sutherland here. Now, Wilson Sutherland was the admissions tutor for New College. He said, send him over. Now, Oxford's not on a grid system. So I sort of meandered through sort of these Harry Potter-like streets, you know, found his staircase, went up, found and spoke to the guy. And he said, well, that's an interesting story. Um, we have six places at New College this year, four taken, one maybe, maybe not, and one we're not sure. But if we have a space, we'll give you a call. So I drive back home. A week later, I get a call. Hey, it looks like we might have a space. Why don't you come and have an interview? Now, we only have seven minutes, so I can't tell you how weird these interviews were. But they were weird, even by Oxford stand. And a week later, I got a call. You have a place. 
I go, what do you mean I have that? He said, would you like to come to Oxford and study here? And I'm like, yeah, that, yeah I'd like to do that. <laughs> and so I did. It's now 1994, 1995. And I'm working at Goldman Sachs. And we're doing this thing, you know, technical term, re-engineering prime brokerage. But basically, we were working with hedge funds and helping them reconcile their records to the records that Goldman Sachs had. And I was working with a guy called Jacob Friedman. Now, Jacob Friedman was recognized as the most brilliant technology advocate, visionary, within Goldman Sachs. He, not only did he, I don't know if he had half a billion, which in those days was a lot of money, or billion dollar, but he had a massive budget. And he was responsible for this project because this project would cascade throughout the organization for record keeping. Um, and we were building these Windows-based applications that would sit on our hedge funds clients' desks to reconcile their records. And one of the technology guys calls me, I say, hey, hey, look at this, this is really cool. I go, what? He goes, look, I can see the weather on my computer screen. I go, wow. I go, what's that? He goes, there's this thing called Mosaic. I go, what's Mosaic? He goes, well, it runs on this ARPANET thing, this internet thing. I go, what's the internet? He goes, and he starts showing it to me. And there isn't, I mean, you gotta understand, there wasn't a back button on Mosaic. And we, there were things called hyperlinks. And it was, you know, it was back in the sort of Gibson days of what the internet would be. And so I, you know, I have this idea and I go and see Jacob. Now Jacob was Ukrainian and I really can't mimic his accent, but you know, he was a intellectual force to be reckoned with. So I go to see Jacob, I go, Jacob, I got this crazy idea. What if instead of us building these applications that sit on our clients' desks, what if instead of doing that, we'd like put it on our server and then our clients use this mosaic browser to come and connect and upload their data and reconcile. And he looks at me and he goes, John, he goes, this internet, it's a plaything for you. This is real business. Now, I kind of bring up these two stories because one of the most difficult things as an individual is to be true to yourself and to follow your instincts when everyone else tells you you're wrong, where everyone else is going left and you go right. And even sometimes when you don't have the data, even often when you don't have the data, you have to learn to follow your gut. 